from Two Keto LLC. It's Keto Woman Podcast with Daisy Brackenhall. Hello, Keto lovelies. I'm Daisy Brackenhall, and I've spent most of my life struggling with my weight and confidence, and I've always had a difficult relationship with food. Even when I finally got to my target weight, after weight loss surgery and eating low carb, I couldn't maintain it and I was miserable. Keto has given me the freedom to fall in love with food again, without the constant gain, loss, guilt, virtue cycle of before. Health and happiness is where it's at now, running on fat. Welcome to the Keto Woman Podcast. Each week, I'll be chatting to inspirational women, maybe even the odd man, to discover the secrets to their success so that I can share them with you. So what is keto? Keto is a way of eating that enables you to switch your body's main fuel source from sugar to fat. Who doesn't want to be a fat burner, right? But how do we achieve this? A great place to start is by keeping carbs to 20 grams or less per day. So things like leafy greens and above ground vegetables, plus some nuts and seeds and the incidental carbs you find in things like dairy. Moderate protein scale to your lean body mass and then fat to satiety. Once you're in the swing of things, you can tweak it to suit you. Make your own personalized keto. I'll be asking my guest each week what their keto looks like to show you just how flexible and fabulous this way of eating can be. I'm not a doctor and most of my guests won't be either, so we can't give you medical advice. It's always best to work with your own doctor because they know you and your medical history and so have access to the bigger picture. Thank you, Trish Roberts, for supporting me and this podcast by making a pledge at my Patreon page. Do you want to hear your name here at the top of the show? Are you enjoying this podcast and would like to help me make more episodes? then head to my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Keto Woman or hit the support button on the Keto Woman podcast website. It means a great deal to me and you will get to headline the show just like Trish did today. This week's Extraordinary Woman is Karen Zinn. Dr. Karen Zinn is a New Zealand registered dietitian and a senior lecturer at AUT University in New Zealand. Her research and clinical practice work focuses on the whole food, low carbohydrate, healthy fat nutrition approach and its application to metabolic health and sports performance. Karen has 22 years of consulting experience as a dietitian. She is also a co author of three books What the Fat, Fats In, Sugars Out, What the Fat, Sports Performance, and her most recent one, What the Fast. I had such an interesting time talking to Karen. She is one busy, extraordinary woman, and I loved her down-to-earth, holistic approach to her work and her own life. I could have gone on for hours chatting, but she has promised to come back and do another podcast in the future. So let me know what you would like to hear her talk about next. Welcome, Karen, to the Keto Woman podcast. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you, Daisy. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. We're um, we're top and tailing it with with ends of the day because you're in New Zealand and I'm in France, so we're opposite sides of the world, aren't we? We are, and I'm all fresh and ready to go. And you're probably a bit tired from a full day. I am. I'm 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 heading to bed, and you're just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your training and what led you to low carb and your nutrition practice and and all the things you do now today? Right. So I'm a registered dietitian and I have have been a dietitian for, oh gosh, for 23 or 24 years now, I think. Um, And I originate from South Africa, from Cape Town, and I trained there um, as a as a dietitian. Um, And interestingly, you know, it it wasn't necessarily what I wanted to do, what I grew up dreaming about doing. Um, I I went to university uh, to do science because that's what I that's what I thought was interesting, with no idea what I was going to come out with at the end of it. Um, And then did a Bachelor of Science degree at uh, University of Cape Town, UCT. And 
Um, and then after the Bachelor of Science, um, I did a postgraduate um, degree in nutrition and dietetics, also at UCT, and um, and then registered as a dietitian and then <laughs> promptly um, hopped over to a different uh, country, came to New Zealand, and um, – and I, I worked in public health, actually, for about four years. So I went from Cape Town, which is a nice big city, to a little place called Whangarei, which has um, a population of about 160,000 people, so a little town in comparison. What made you make that move from South Africa to New Zealand? Oh, I'm actually going to say this on air. I followed a boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I came with my partner at the time um, as a bit of an adventure. And my, I, I guess my, my original thoughts were, um, if I hate it, I'll, I'll go home. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, and, you know, that, that's really, that's really the long and the short of it. So, um, so four years in the, in this little town and then, I sort of fell into academia um, with my naivety, I'll have to say, uh, because I thought, oh, I'll apply for this job because I, I really like teaching. So I applied for the job at AUT in Auckland, moved down to Auckland, got the job, and then um, and then realized that universities were all about research. So, so I had to continue studying, which was absolutely fine. So I did a master's um, in the area of the – my master's was was sports nutrition um and then i did a phd and the area was around uh weight loss or losing weight and keeping it off long term weight loss maintenance so the study continued and i mean i'll, I'll have to be honest study always continues um even though i formally finished my my degrees and my letters and my numbers and whatever study is just continuing all the time um so you, you have to embrace it whichever way you look at it, formally or, or informally. Um, so that was my training. Um, and, and I guess like all other dietitians uh, that went through training back then, or, or even now, I have to say, um, it, was, it was very mainstream nutrition that was communicated to us. And – um, and it's interesting because I think, I think it it was maturity that gave me an inquiring mind. I certainly wasn't one of those kids who grew up going, why you know, why is the moon round and why is this and why is that? I just accepted stuff, um, <laughs> and and I continued to accept stuff when I went to university. I just you know they they taught about taught us about the nutrition guidelines and I felt no reason to question what they were telling us because those were the professors and the tutors and I was a, you know, what, 20 year old um, student with, with nothing in life, you know, apart from 20 years of, you know, growing up. So who was I to, to question these things? Um, and that's, those years and that training really laid the foundation for my nutrition knowledge, um, which translated into nutrition practice and nutrition research. So, you know, like everyone, I went, I went through my years, uh, basing all my, all my teachings and all my understandings on, you know, the trusty food pyramid, um, healthy whole grains, lots of carbohydrate. Um, and actually when I first came across the, the you know macronutrient ratio proportions and guidelines uh carbohydrate was 55 to 70 percent um of total energy it's it's dropped now to around 45 to 65 percent i mean it's dropped a smidgen <laughs> um yeah. but it used to be it used to be higher in fact used to be even lower um and and over the last 20 years, I mean, it's taken a seriously long time, but over the years, the carbohydrate guidelines have dropped a smidgen and the fat guidelines have, have, have been tweaked a little bit, but it's still, it, it doesn't play out like that when you look at um, what's in the supermarket and what people eat, still eat very high carb, very low fat. So presumably, having been in the field for quite a long time, you've seen changes in your approach and your recommendations to your clients have you oh or, absolutely you know, you, yeah you haven't yeah. you haven't been low carb for all that time 
No, in fact, I, I've only been low carb for a very short um, space of time in my career, and it was only about six years ago that um, that I changed my practice, and it was it, it was a, a very um, it, it was a very unsettling time for me. I must be honest. Um, you know, when you are when you are a dietitian and you are a registered dietitian, no matter what job you have, whether it's public health or academia or private practice or um, food service or whatever, you you still um, governed by those foundations, and uh, that's sort of you know the, the the basis of everything. And when I got wind of of the the controversy to the extent that I did six years ago, it really like rocked my um, my foundations, and I and I, I thought, oh my god, I'm going to have to leave dietetics because I actually don't I don't know what to do with this information. Um, and I I really believe that this whole journey um, is has has to do with um, experience as a dietitian and maturity um, as a person and as a dietitian because I. I certainly came across this before, you know, um, the Atkins diet, uh, you know, I was, I was all over that information in, in the, you know, uh, I guess it first came about late eighties, was it? Um, mm-hmm. no, maybe a bit later. And, um, and I remember, I distinctly remember teaching my students that, uh, ketosis is dangerous and that low carb diet, you, you know, pros and cons, cons, heart disease, tick, Bad breath, tick. Nutritional ketosis, tick. Dangerous. So, um, and I could probably still find the slides somewhere. You know, in those days, it was overhead transparencies, <laughs> um, and and you know, I I I believe that my students believe me because um, they did to a certain extent what I did as a student, and it was just you know believe what you were told, and um, and and this is. Um, Sad but true. But students often go through their their study by doing the the, the minimum extra work. Um, you've got your lecture notes, and you might have a reading or two, and that's it. You unless you have an assignment where you you actually look at the depth of information around an area, you you just accept. So so my students were just accepting what I was saying, and then. Atkins just kind of went away, went off my radar. And then, interestingly, during my PhD, which is only around uh, 2000 and sort of 11-ish, 2012, um, I came across, because it was all about weight loss, um, I came across some some studies that included, you know, a low-carb arm um, and, and it just, it just sort of dropped off my, you know, dropped out of my, my head. I didn't acknowledge it. Um, it was just this non entity. It was like it didn't exist. And, you know, it's interesting because it's only when you come out of it and you have a more holistic view, can you see how, um, how narrow minded and particularly how arrogant, <laughs> you know, that is to just ignore stuff. Um, because of the foundations that you've got rather than entertain the idea and read more about it. Um, so, and then it came back, um, and it came back probably, yes, about six years ago, and and that's when I couldn't get away from it. And um, and that's the time that uh, that I totally changed my mind. Yeah, yeah. And so presumably – before that time, you were just working within the the typical guidelines. Yes, absolutely. So in my in my uh, my academic world, the research that we that we would do would would be all about um, you know if it was weight loss, it was um, about calorie restriction and it was about portion control. And instead of having three cups of pasta, you have two and a half cups of pasta. And instead of having, um, you know, a tablespoon of butter, you have a teaspoon of margarine or even better a spray of, you know, canola oil. Um, and it was all in that context. And of course, um, in my practice, it was also in that context. But I, I have to say one thing that might surprise some of your listeners is that um, it did work for, for a lot of people, you know, um, high carb, Low fat, calorie control, absolutely works. Um, 
But it works at the expense of several things. So number one, it works at the expense of being hungry consistently. It works at the uh, it works because you are in calorie deficit. So of course you are going to lose weight. You are you are consuming less calories than your body needs. So you will lose weight. Um, and it comes with a healthy dose of over exercising. I have to say. So. Um, it was during that time where you are just focused on results rather than what goes hand in hand with getting those results that you know that that sort of made you continue and once again it's only when when things um are done differently like now do you see that actually weight loss is purely just a bonus with everything else that comes with low carb um and you know yes you are still in a calorie deficit because and we can talk a little bit more about energy balance um because i still think it's 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 absolutely relevant when it comes to weight loss um but of course we know we know that you can achieve weight more effortlessly and you can experience satiation or a lack of hunger to the point that um you naturally miss meals which was unheard of in a high carb world yeah you're just waiting aren't you for the yeah. next rice cake and whatever else you can <laughs> absolutely <have. laughs> i used to be that person and i and i'm not um i i've never needed to lose weight i've been really lucky but i was still that person that would have about three muesli bars in my handbag waiting for the time where i could just you know open the bag and and eat yeah you're literally um, just clock watching aren't you for the, <laughs> the next absolutely. time absolutely you are clock watching it's so true and of course and, and of course if you go anywhere that's out Outside of your routine, like to the airport or to a meeting, there's always that muesli bar in your bag, you know, in case you get hungry. Um, so, so low carb comes with this level of f- freedom from food, um, and it comes with um, not having to exercise. And what I really like about this is when I talk about exercise with people now, because I, I am very holistic in my practice, I talk about exercise in a very different way. Um, so it's really about doing um, the amount and the type of exercise that's going to make you happy, that's going to um, keep you fit, that's going to make your bones strong, your bone mineral density um, strong or robust and um, it's going to be sustainable. So it's not exercising for weight loss. It's exercising for health. And I just think it's a better, it's a better goal to have um, when, when you think about exercise. And, of course, when people do get injured, um, it's not the end of the world. Be- I mean, it, it's serious, but it's not the end of the world because you still have your, you know, your, your, your diet and your diet strategy to, to help with all these other things. Um, and and when i said weight loss is a bonus it's those other things that you get that that i've i've never i've never heard before um in the in the high carb low fat way of eating so it's that um reduction of um aches and pains and inflammation it's the more stable mood it's the improved sleep it's the weird and wonderful conditions just um just being tidied up and 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 disappearing really um it's the level of energy it's the level of clarity and and a and a phrase that i hear very very often is um is the removal of brain fog um people mm. feel people feel clear headed and you you do have to wonder how people operate um or how people used to operate in a high carb low fat space um you know when they when they uncover all these benefits when things when things are changed so it really you know it, it, when you listen to the low carb community it can sound quite um it can sound quite out there with you know oh it changed my life it saved my life it's revolutionary and it's this and that um and it's actually true um it is actually true and from a from a critic it can sound like an infomercial but it is it is absolutely 100% true and that's why you get people coming out of the woodwork who I used to be overweight now I'm slim I used to have this and now I've 
I haven't got it anymore, that want to take the message and spread it and work in this world uh, and create a job for themselves in this world because it is it's immensely satisfying being able to help people um, along this journey. It's great. Exactly. And it it just, instead of this awful diet that you've got to find motivation from somewhere to maintain because you're just feeling awful all the time, it's this way of eating that is giving you all the benefits and more. So it's just something, you know, that you want to carry on with as yeah. well as being a delicious way of eating. So, yeah. I mean, you know, it doesn't feel onerous in any kind of way, does it? Yeah, I think um, I think people can make it onerous. It's really, I really think the way to succeed with this way of eating, whether you go low carb or keto, and we might talk about um, that a little bit later, um, is really how you view it. Um, it's all, it's all, and also with fasting, it's, it's all in the mind. It's all about how you, how you use your, your, your brain and, and your mental stimulus to approach these things and how you view these things in the context of, um, your world, your, your social world, um, and, and everything that's, you know, that, um, that surrounds that. Yeah. So it's really just mm -hmm. how you, how you view it, um, to allow it to continue in the way that you want it to. Yeah. And I'd be interested to know a bit about your PhD. You you talk about it being about weight loss and maintaining that weight loss. Certainly, that's something I've always found hard. I mean, I've I've lost weight plenty of times. You know, I've I've been dieting since since I was fifteen, and I've had a progressive upward trend. But you know, it's gone up and down and up and down over that mm. time by having periods of time where, where I stick to some kind of diet or other, but it's the maintenance that's, that's the problem. Like you said before, it's, you know, it's relatively easy to lose weight, you know, mm. purely by going into an energy deficit, for example, but it's maintaining it because at some point you stop doing it because it's so awful. <laughs> and that's when, you, well, that's when you put the weight back on. So yeah. what, what did you find with looking at the maintenance side of it when you were when you were researching? Yeah, I mean, weight loss maintenance is um, is is the is the real issue. I think with with all diets or ways of eating, even low carb. I mean, it would be foolish to say once you go low carb, that's it for you, you know, forever. Because the oh, studies absolutely. the studies don't show that. The studies show that actually, whatever diet you go on. Um, only a certain, you know, percentage of people actually maintain it because the foot comes off the brake. Um, you, you, you're feeling good. You're looking good. You, you've ticked off your goal. Um, and life gets in the way, um, moving forward. Oh, I'm absolutely a testament to that. And I'm, yeah. I am really good at putting on weight extremely quickly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I know that's possible. Yeah. And I think, I think almost when people set goals, um, they shouldn't necessarily set the goal weight that they want to want to be or want to get to. It should be the, the goal weight where they want to get to after they've got there. Do you know what I mean? Like including a, a, a maintenance area. So you know, my in my PhD. So it it was you know it was um, underpinned by you know the, the foundations of of nutrition, high carb, low fat, you know. And um, so there were there were several studies involved. Um, and one one of them was a randomized control trial intervention. But um, one of the other studies that I did was actually looked at um, – I looked at all the private practice dietitians in New Zealand, well, the ones that um, wanted to be scrutinized, and we looked at – their um, clients that they had been seeing for a one-year period, um, and we looked at their outcomes with with their clients. And um, what we found was that um, about a third of uh, people who lost weight actually kept it off long term, um, but the rest kind of tracked closer to um, – you know, back to the beginning. And there were some interesting things that we found in there, um, including the more um, the more frequent your consultation, the better the outcome. Um, we looked at online versus face-to-face. Uh, -face, um, and usually online 
is, a, well, online tended to be a little bit more helpful because you can have more contact with online. It doesn't have to be, you know, sitting in an office, sitting, going through traffic and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot more you can do online. But it's that intensity of the support and the intensity of the, of that intervention or, or contact that, that really, um, dictates outcomes. So I'll just park that for a minute. So about a third of people. And then we looked at, um, I did a, uh, an intervention and I took two, I, I worked with a, um, an electric, uh, company. Um, and I had a group down in Auckland and I had my control group, which was the same company, but they were based in, um, Wangarei where, um, which was the original place that I moved to when I came to New Zealand. And we put these people on a 12 week program. And from a maintenance perspective, we left the people in up north in, in Wangarei alone for nine months. We did nothing. And then the people in Auckland, we did these little mini interventions. So they got, you know, to listen to podcasts and they got little seminars and things. And we looked at, um, we looked at the maintenance after, after one year period. Um, and there was very little difference uh, between the two groups. But what we found was again, that magic number of around a third of people lost weight and kept it off. Um, the intervention that I put together. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed my PhD. Um, I worked with a, um, with a workplace health company, um, called Vitality Works to do it. And we developed this, this, this weight loss program, which was called the Power of Three. And, um, it was about making changes to small changes to three areas of your life. So one was eating, one was moving, and one was, um, one was mindfulness. So they had to choose, you know, we looked at the original diet and they had to choose three things that, um, that, they would change from each area. So the one would be um, have a little less pasta for dinner. Um, The other one would be walk a few more steps in your day. And a mindfulness one might be, um, you know, don't eat when you are in the car or sitting in front of the TV. Um, And then every few weeks they selected their own set of changes. So even though this was in the context of high carb, low fat, it was still a fabulous intervention. It was based on Mm. small changes that people found doable. Um, and it was quite holistic. So I'm, I'm still proud of the work that I did. And I don't think that, um, it was useless, even though I've totally changed my nutrition paradigm. Um, but again, a third of people who lost weight, uh, kept it off long term, which mirrored the outcomes for the dietitians and which actually happens to mirror what you find in studies as well. Even looking at drugs, you know, even looking at, uh, you know, weight loss medication and things. So, um, that magic number of a third is, is, is kind of interesting. Um, and that's really at a population level. I think at an individual level, things, things look a little bit different. You know, if you have people are paying to come and see me in my private practice and you holding their hand, um, and with, with low carb, you tend to, well, you, do you get yeah you, you tend to get better outcomes with low carb so i don't know what the number would be whether it's higher than a third but you tend to get better outcomes because of all those things that i said before they're not hungry they're not a slave to food they're all these other benefits um but again the psychology and the behavior is still there you can't escape it so life gets in the way and um and as you know, we live in a in a toxic food environment. Wherever you turn, there's choice that um, that you know steers us in the wrong direction. So, um, you know, we can control, we can control, but we set up to fail all around us, which is really challenging. Really and challenging. It's, it's horrendous in some places. I mean, I've just been back to the UK this weekend, and uh, Hugh Fanny Whittingsource has just done a, a program on the BBC called. Um, the the fat fight I believe and he's talking about this just bombardment of sweet things in general chocolate and all the rest of it around the tills and and things like that and I noticed that when I was in I think it was WH Smith's and I was there to I bought a couple of books and you know I obviously walked past the chocolate aisle and all the rest Mm. of it but I was at the tills 
paying and and it is just literally surrounded all in front of you there are different chocolate bars and offers and they even ask you when you're paying you know oh well would you like this bar of dairy milk you know buy yeah. one and and get one free and it's it's just there in your face all the time yeah. and i have to, i have to say in france it's 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 nowhere near as bad as that and it's all right okay it's 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 really hard when you're confronted with it all the time if if those are the kind of foods that really really tempt you and some Someone mm. puts, you know, a great deal in front of you. Like you, you only need to buy one, and we're going to give you another one free. It's it's quite hard to resist, isn't it? It's very it's very hard. Willpower is a, t- a terrible thing, and most people have this battle. Um, we we have it here, yeah, absolutely in the supermarkets, but at the service stations when you go fill up with petrol and you go inside to pay, and and they go, well, that be all, and it's like, well, yes, it is all. Otherwise, I would have said otherwise. And they go, oh, would you like two of these, you know? two of these chocolates for like you know three cents or something no i wouldn't but you know people just like oh what a bargain of course i'll I'll grab that and they upsell um and it it is everywhere and in fact um yesterday i picked up a this little snack pack from a local dairy in in auckland so a local kind of um, convenience store um which is on on route um to, to schools, right? So kids pass this dairy all the time. And there's a little snack pack and it had um, this, <laughs> it had this drink in it with some, um, this colorful, sugary, horrible red stuff. Um, and it was, it had a Chinese label, so I don't even know what it was. Um, and then it had like Oreo cookies, which are these um, creamy biscuits. And then it had two packets of, of chips, um, different like a burger rings and something else. And um, they were selling it for $2.50 um, New Zealand. And that's, you know, $2.50. It's just like, oh, my God, you, you can't even buy a liter of milk for $2.50. Um, wow. It was dirt cheap. And, and I just think um, – you know, we, when you actually sit back and think about how we are set up to fail, it, it actually can be quite disheartening and quite depressing. So it almost pays not to not to think about that and actually try and control what you can control because those sorts of things are actually not going to change. You can run up and down and throw your hands in the air and 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 get the world to sign petitions uh, for things, but the reality is that the person who owns the convenience store can do whatever they want to do and they will do it because they mm-hmm. get the money. Um, so it's, again, on a population level, you know, when you look at what's going on around the world and, and all the temptations, it's, it's depressing. So you, you can't think about that. You just have to, you just have to control your environment. And, and when I mean control your environment, I'm not a, I'm not a zealot. Um, I, I, I do believe in treats and I do believe in, um, embracing the realities of, um, of indulgences, uh, but it's the extent to which you, d- you do this. And it's also in context with what your goal might be that steers you um, to that kind of number of things that you might have per week or whatever that you choose. Um, yeah, so it, it, it's, a, it's a toxic environment. It's funny, I had a client yesterday who was saying, you know, and they go out for um, – she, she's a new mum and she goes out with other mums for, for coffee and they she says, that's my treat is I have a, a coffee and a, and a slice. And I, and I thought it's, it's, it's the way society builds it up. Why do we have to have a coffee and a something? Why can't we just have a coffee? Or alternatively, why can't we have a coffee and a small handful of almonds? Because they don't sell those kinds of things there. Um, you know, uh, it's just, it's interesting. It's eating, eating is um, ever present. It's everywhere and it's, um, it's always encouraged. And, and that's why I think when you enter into the world of fasting or intermittent fasting, it, um, it's a very interesting insight into how we have food shoved down our faces and into our ears, you know, 24-7. Exactly. And we are pushed to just snack all the time. You know, I don't, yeah, yeah I don't, I don't need a snack with my coffee because, you know, I've had breakfast and I'll be having lunch later. I don't, I don't need something else in between. Yeah. And it's interesting because, you know, um, <laughs> 
the psychology of it is is fascinating, and I and I don't even think I I fully understand it. And and my I mean my eating is is mostly beautiful, but not always. Um, and I know that when I work at home, I. I'm into the fridge and the cupboard all the time. Okay, so I don't keep bad stuff in there um, because I'll just eat it. I know it. Um, but I I overeat good stuff. So, you know, I'm, I'm doing some work and then I'll, you know, go upstairs to the kitchen and have some, you know, nut butter on a piece of cheese and then I'll have a few more of them and I'll come down and then a half an hour later I'll go up, have a cup of tea and have a few more. And I'm, I'm not hungry. I don't need them. But that satisfaction of eating food is is very interesting um and i think people need to be made aware or, or think a bit more carefully about their food environment um and i know that when i work at home i overeat so so i limit the the, the amount of time that i that i work at home um and i acknowledge that a bit of overeating when i work at home for whatever reason is is okay in the context of of my world so um you know, it's it, it's just fascinating looking at the psychology and the behavior um, that goes with eating. Because, of course, if we all ate just to fuel ourselves, um, we wouldn't have a, a big problem. And um, I was thinking about this the other day. If we lost our sense of smell, um, I think everyone would eat a whole lot less. Because, oh, I know. Um, I've known a couple of people who – who have for some reason and all the pleasure goes out of eating because they 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 can't taste anything yeah yeah they completely changed their way of eating a, a woman i used to work with um years ago in the garden center in the uk she she ate for other things like texture and uh, yes. you know so she she mixed textures to get some excitement and pleasure in her food because she could get nothing from taste so it was all about things like color and texture because that's all she had to work with yeah i do wonder what i would how my intake would change um i i, I would definitely still eat low carb because i know it's better for me internally um but i i don't suspect i would snack because i think my 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 snacking um, is really all about all oh, the taste of almond butter, you know. <laughs> um, oh, me too. And I'm so glad to hear you say that because I'm <laughs> exactly the same. When I'm working from home, I definitely eat more and and graze. But yeah. I, I tell you what's made the difference for for me on that score is that I've started. I've been determined to set up a regular routine of fasting for a while now. And I started last week, this is my second week into it, where I fast on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. And each one ends up being about 36 hours because I go from the preceding evening through to the following eating days, lunchtime. So it's, you know, a decent, a decent length fast. And what I found is... One, it completely got rid of my Coke Zero addiction, oh, brilliant. <laughs> which is which is reared up again. And I've been trying to get rid of for ages and haven't been able to. It did it almost immediately. But also I found that the snacking has got less when I'm at home because I'm very picky, too. And I don't really know why, but it has, which I'm very thankful for. Well, so here's the thing. Um and and I would absolutely 100% agree with you. I think the beauty about fasting is when you when you know you're going to fast, like today I'm fasting, it becomes a rule. Um, and even when I'm working at home, and if I'm having a fasting day, I don't snack because that's it's because I'm fasting. But if I'm not fasting, it's like a it's like a free for all. And I think that is one of the beauties about fasting is that you, you don't have to think about what you're going to have or how much you're going to have and when you're going to have it and how many calories and how many grams mm. of carbs. Just you having just, nothing. <laughs> you just, you just have nothing. So it's like a, it's a non negotiable. Um, and that can be very helpful for people who are in challenging food environments. Um, and interestingly, when I did my, um, my three day fast, um, so I was just experimenting with it purely because I, I, do, I do everything before I tell my clients to, to do things um, and also just to experience what it was like. And I, 
I, I did it. I was um, we went up north to um, to our, our little um, our little beach house up north, and I was working from there for the for the week. And for those three days, uh, my workspace because it's, it's a little place is right next is is, is in the kitchen really because our kitchen sort of lounge is, is one area. And I was working pretty much in the kitchen, which is right next to the pantry. Um, but because I was on this three day fast, there was no you know. There was no temptation there. It was fascinating. So I think once you mm. have made up your mind and once you have the rule, and, and, and here's the key. Once you actually go, food is off limits, then it's like, well, th- you know, if you think about it, that's unproductive thought. So turn your thoughts and your energies into what you are doing. Don't think about food because um, you're not having it. End of story. Um, so it's, it sort of can be quite black and white. Um, and you know, the first time or the second time you do it, you might battle with those thoughts. But um, I was going to th- say it's it's definitely a battle of wills when I started, but I have noticed it's getting easier and with just yeah. with the regularity. Yeah, absolutely. So it is a it, it's a fascinating psychology uh, fasting. That, that's for sure. That's for sure. I mean, I think doing a um, doing like a, a time restricted eating like like yours, like an eighteen hours or something. Um, and um, what we've come up with in our new book, uh, what the fast called super fasting, um, which is which is two lots of twenty four hours in a row. So like Sunday night to Monday night, and then have a have a dinner, have a, a nice, beautiful, nutrient rich dinner, and then repeat it again on Tuesday. So fast on Tuesday and have a dinner, a beautiful dinner on Tuesday night. I think that that's quite doable. Uh, particularly if you are um, if you are working in a busy job and y- you have you have dinner because you know that dinner is going to be um, it, it's going to be there so you can kind of hang in um, for the day like missing breakfast is easy it probably gets a, a bit challenging maybe mid morning or maybe mid afternoon and then it's like oh I can just hang on till dinner um, so it's it's very doable for people whereas missing dinner can be can be quite quite the challenge, particularly if you've got to cook it for the rest of your family. Oh, exactly. That that's that's the benefit I have that I live alone, so I can completely control. If if, if I had to cook dinner for other people, there's there's no way I could do it. But that knowing that you haven't got to go too long before you can eat again, that that's helped me actually. You know, well, you know, when I'm feeling hungry, particularly at dinner time, is the difficult time. But knowing, well, no, you've only got to hang out till tomorrow, and then you mm. know, lunchtime lovely bacon and eggs it's 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 not too long to wait and i i wonder also we're, we're talking about we're we're both um you know both both snack monsters a bit mm-hmm. i wonder if actually having you know some days where you're fasting actually balances out those days if if you do find you're a bit of a snacker because you know we know don't we that that if you eat regularly you're constantly spiking your insulin and that that has some impact, mm-hmm. but if you if you're counterbalancing that with fasting days where you're not spiking your insulin at all, I wonder if it helps balance it out a bit. You, you mean um, overall insulin resistance or insulin yes. sensitivity? Um, that, yeah, that's an interesting question. I I, I don't know, but I think that um, I think that people need to be very very careful that they don't use fasting as an excuse to overeat or to eat poor quality food the other time. And I think there is a there is an element of uh of feeling virtuous when you when you fast and um and that sort of gives you the it gives you the license to have a little bit more of um, of the food that you would normally eat or that you would not normally eat because you've like, oh, I've been fasting. So I think we need to be very, very careful there because what we don't want to see is um, is, is going from a you know stable blood sugar, reduced insulin to the to the opposite, which is just everything all over the show. Um, of course, if you're snacking on low carb foods, like you know, and and my snacking is certainly like. Like I said, some um, you know, a bit of peanut butter or, or nut butter on some cheese, or it might be a little pot of um, yogurt with some grain-free granola on it. Oh, absolutely, same here. It, it's all low-carb foods. Yeah. Interesting enough, I found my appetite reduced on eating days, which I didn't necessarily expect. Which interesting. Is yeah, good. That, that, yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah. I think it for, for me personally, I think it might have something to do with the weight loss surgery I had, although it was quite a long time ago. 
mm-hmm. I think it sort of dials back in the restriction a bit. I think mm-hmm. maybe it has something to do with that. But um, yes, interesting. I, I was just just wanted to go back briefly, and there probably isn't an answer to this, but that third of people mm-hmm. who manage to lose weight and maintain that weight loss, what's special about them? Is there anything, you know, that that always seems to be the case? Uh, you know, I assume there may be, you know, this group of super, super adherers or something, but is there something particular that they do or they can do that other people can't? There was... N- there, there wasn't um, – I can't recall if, if anything came out of my PhD work, but we have done some work um, – we did some work uh, uh, several years ago. A master's student of mine did some work with some menopausal women um, and put them on a um, – put them on a an eight-week, I think, an eight-week uh, – oh, no, or 12-week uh, – low carb um, eating pattern or plan. It wasn't a prescribed plan. It was like eat more of this and eat less of that. Um, and and this was a there was no control group. Um, it was it was a translational study, like let's see how this plays out. Um, and it had a a really good qualitative component. So it, it looked at uh, what what were the barriers, what were the enhancers um, and let's look at what happens with your weight. And the ones that had more success and greater adherence um, had definitely had more support. So support by spouses and friends and family is um, is a massive determinant of whether you're going to succeed long term. And I think that can apply to any age group. But of course, it's no, um, it's. It's it's most um, evident when you when you're dealing with kids because of course families feed their kids so if you don't have the support of the you know the mum and the dad and the brother and the sister um, then it, it's it's just a lost cause because you'll do something for twelve weeks and then it's like oh end of the study and now I can go eat what they're eating so if you if you don't have the support um, you're in trouble. Um, there's also a there's a massive database called the National Weight Control Registry, um, and this is a group in the US that have been collecting data um, on um, hundreds of thousands of people um, that have lost weight and kept it off. and And the criteria to enter the database is that you have to I can't recall the exact figures, but you have to have lost um, a certain percentage of your weight and have and have to have kept it off for one year to be part of this database. And um, and they've they've done several uh, several studies on on the outcomes and what they found two things that come through quite strongly with this group um, is that those that have been more successful tend to be the ones that regularly weigh themselves um, and that regularly check in with their food monitoring so. So I, I know a lot of people don't like scales um, and they don't like writing down what they eat or putting it into apps. But um, we find through through this research and in my practice as well that um, that regular weight monitoring and coming back to to putting your food into an app every now and again to keep you honest to rein you in just just keeps you on on the straight and narrow. It's I think once you lose weight you will always have to. Um, think about it. You, will, it will always be there. So I think if you, if you think that it's it's going to go away, I've hit my goal weight and everything's going to be hunky dory from now on. You're dreaming. You constantly have to be mindful, um, and that's not a bad thing. It's just it's just how it is, and people need to acknowledge that. Um, I always get my clients to when they um, when they lose weight, we come up with a a range, a target range um, where they can sit in because, of course, your weight fluctuates every single day. So settling on, you know, you know 71.8 is not going to it's not going to mm. work. So we come up with a range and um, and I get them to weigh themselves regularly and, and the word regularly is, is very different for different people. But when they come to the top of their range – and they go over that, and they don't hear warning bells, they need to call me. Um, and that's when they can come in, we can have a chat, and the chat's with me. I don't tell them anything new. It's more of a support. It's a, a, it's a reset. Let's get back to basics. Let, let's get your good habits um, 
you know, back and, and usually it's, oh, I'm a bit less organized, I'm really busy at work or I don't have much me time. And so we talk through those things and, um, and bring people back and rein them in. So I think it's a very healthy way of, um, of, of making sure that your weight doesn't, doesn't return by having these, um, built in alarm bells that you, that you might see at a certain point that your, you know, certain threshold, um, where your weight sits yeah Mm, it's catching it before it starts going too far because there's certainly with me if I ignore those early warning bells like you say and it goes past a certain point it sort of becomes a well I might as well just let it go now and and it you just kind of start the slide and it gets more and more difficult to pull it back in so if yeah yeah if you can if you can have that point that that you mm. need to start doing something before it gets to the point where you're really, really depressed about it. Totally. It's that procrastination, which is, which is not good. And, you know, um, it's really interesting. When you have a period of time where you, um, where you don't exercise or where you're not eating brilliantly, to get back on, on the horse is, is, quite, is quite tricky. And, you know, you can – you can come up with any behavioral mechanisms, um, any triggers that you want. But I always come back to one of my favorite, favorite, favorite logos that um, that I can think of. And it's the Nike logo, um, the swoosh, you know, the tick. Um, and I think that logo is it's so simple and it is so powerful because it means just do it. And sometimes you can talk yourself, you know, black and blue about why you should do something but actually you just just do it and and then when you do something um and you keep doing it it will become habitual and then once it's once it's habitual it's easy it becomes easy so it's that um you know if you if you want to um, become a morning exerciser and you you know you can talk yourself around it and oh it's too cold and it's too this it's like just do it and you do it for a few weeks um, and you might not enjoy it at, at the at the start but then it becomes habitual and then you find that you actually do enjoy it and it it's it, it plays out quite well and I know this doesn't um, apply to everyone because everyone's got very different strategies but I always think back to the Nike swoosh um, I think they they are geniuses for um, for coming up with a logo like that exactly no that that's so true it's often just a case of getting through that initial pain period isn't it until like you say it starts to become habit and you start to realize that you actually quite enjoy it yeah yeah and you know um, Daisy just on your other point about what what is common to the people who have success I also think there's a um, there's a range of personalities that that you get with this and I think some people you can just tell them what to do and they'll do it um, and they'll do it forever and and I have some clients that I I think that what they're doing is too restrictive and I think they'll fall off but they don't um, so so by having a treat for some people that that is that is not good because that makes them fall off. So they, they they work out that by needing to be restrictive is how they're going to achieve their goals and they can stick to it no problem. So I think really um, one of my – probably what one of my strengths is that I, I'm able to read my clients um, – quite quite well and I'm able to work with them in whichever way that that it needs to happen I very rarely tell people what I think they should do I I let them come up with um what what they believe will work for them and I help guide them of course but I think um you need that intuition you need to be able to to really really listen to someone to work with them to achieve their goals um whatever that might be Exactly. So you don't have a standard approach. You tailor your approach to each person that comes through your door. Yeah. And I do think, um, you know, I am biased towards low carb, but it's a healthy bias because I've been biased against low carb for most of my career. So I actually don't think it's a bias at all. It's, no. <laughs> it's, it's actually, it's actually looking at the practice and the, and the evidence and, uh, and working with, with the best scenario. But within low carb, there is incredible variation as to how you can work. And 
Um, and I think what people don't realize is that there is a spectrum of, of carb and it's, it's lower carb. It depends on where you come from. If you come from 500 grams of carbs a day, um, then 200 grams can be low carb for you. Um, if you come from 100 grams of carbs, then maybe keto is for you getting a little bit more um, extreme and, and restrictive. So, um, so there is a spectrum and I think, I think working again, reading people and seeing how they operate in social circumstances, and when they go away on holiday and things like that, you can you can get a sense of of where they need to be within the spectrum. And of course, you could um, work within you know you could operate within cycles within the spectrum. So. Um, our super fasting protocol is really um, awesome for that because it it gets you into ketosis when you are on your fasting days and then you you come out of ketosis with your low carb days and then you might have a treat on the weekend and um you know embrace realities and then it's cycle you can cycle back into you know ketosis the next week so you get to experience the the health benefits of being in, in ketosis you get the benefits of actually just eating low carb and not being super restrictive and you also get the benefits of taking the foot off the brake when you need to um, and I think that's something that people are seeking out because um, because it can be very black and white um, and, and people do drop off yeah I mean there's so much gray in between and you you need to embrace that don't you yeah for sure do you find with the with the women who come to see you there is a particular group of women and or particular issues they they come to you with? I mean, I'll have to say that, you know, I get a wide range of clients ranging from, you know, young young athletes to, um, to, you know, elderly people wanting to control their diabetes. Um, But I do get a lot of middle-aged women um, who have battled with, with weight their whole life. And, um, and it's interesting because when I first got into low carb, um, People would come to me and and I would have to tell them all about low carb and we'd sort of we'd sort of start from scratch, right? And now six years down the track, I get a lot of women who are coming to me and they're already doing low carb, but they are and they have got some results, but they're stuck and they don't know what to do from from there. And um, and it's it's quite freeing actually because then I don't have to convince them about low carb or keep on you know you don't have to talk to them for hours about you know insulin and all that kind of stuff you can just actually work on the you know the the nitty gritty details of of what they can do and a lot of the time um it's people overeating delicious foods like nuts and like cheese and particularly putting cream in their coffee um, because these foods have been liberated now and and that's when I come back to energy balance. And I do think that there is a very, very big difference between energy balance dynamics when you are a high-carb, low-fat person and when you are a low-carb, high-fat or healthy-fat person. Um, the, the dynamics are very different because you're not taking into consideration the whole hormonal milieu of the body. Um, but when you are low-carb, um, and you overeat calories, they're not going to magically disappear. So it's about, it's about, um, I don't want, I hate using the word control, but, it, but it's true. It's about controlling those calories. And that's where I think fasting really comes into its own. Because, um, if you've got some days of the week where you're not eating at all and other days where you're eating, but not in a very restrictive way, that can be very beneficial for overall calorie balance over the week. So, um, so, so that's, that, that's a, that's a clientele that I see. Another, um, another part of my clientele is, um, is menopausal. So around menopause is a, is a really tricky time for people. Um, and you get the stubborn fat, which is, which is hard to move and you get, um, all the things that go with that. So th- there's a bit of work around that. Um, and then there's another group of people I see who are doing everything right, but are still not getting anywhere. And it's 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 really to do with um, their hormones being all over the show, particularly in relation to stress. Um, and I think um, stress, stress, is, stress is a real demon. Um, and we know very little about 
it's it's kind of intangible because we we know that it's bad um we know that it it, it affects things negatively we also know that a little a little bit of stress is really good um so it's the it's the chronic stress um that, that is really um quite damaging and what's most damaging about that is people think um that they are not stressed but actually um there are things that occur in people's lives um uh, and that have occurred in people's lives that can contribute to this underlying stress that doesn't manifest on a daily you know panic basis like um like the death of of a loved one or a, you know an, an animal or something which you you had a real struggle with that just kind of sits there and impacts things and causes stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline to be a little bit messy um and that causes a, a high internal glucose environment so while you are eating low carb your your internal environment says that you are high carb because of the glucose so th- there's a there's a lot of that that i see um so a lot of talk goes into managing stress um i think it's it's really naive for people to say we need to decrease your stress because that's sometimes impossible to do but it's not I was going to say yeah, yeah. I I've, I've, I've seen so many people who say that that there's that they have all these stresses mm. and yeah the obvious thing is to is to reduce that but it, it's just not always possible is no, it it's, so, it's you not. Know, what what can people do to well it's to help about with that? it's about it's not about decreasing your stress it's about becoming resilient and managing your stress well um and i think a resilient person um is able to have an internal environment in the body a hormone environment a neurotransmitter environment um that is healthy um by being resilient and managing your stress well and and that means very different things to to different people um and you know sometimes you can criticize people for sitting in front of the tv for 2 hours a night um but actually that is their de-stressing period they get up at 5 in the morning and they're running around and they're damage controlling um and they yeah they do a bit of exercise so they're not unhealthy but they want to come home and just vegetate in front of some mindless tv program and what's wrong with that um nothing if that's helpful um some people find uh that just you know meditation like for me for example if you tell me to meditate um or to you know light a candle and put my feet up against the wall for 20 minutes a day it is just it's just not going to happen um but i know that if i go into my special beach whatever the weather um you know if it's if it's pouring with rain it's 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 as liberating as if it's beautifully sunny um and if i'm if i'm walking or running on the beach if i'm in that beautiful environment it just grounds me and that grounding is my de-stressor um and i don't have to necessarily be alone but it's that environment that that is so powerful for me as a as a as a grounding agent or or de-stressor so i think everyone needs to find out what it is that helps them and then try and integrate that into their lives um when they can as regularly as possible um and and it's no good saying oh yeah my de stress is when i go on holiday once a year no 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 we we need it regularly we need to make sure that you are having your me time or, or de stressing more regularly than once a year so um working with people to to help them find out what it is um that that makes them more resilient to handle their stress better is is a, is a really um is a massive key to to unlocking the those kind of lasting secrets of of weight loss um in the context of when you're doing low carb and everything else is under control exactly and to find a way to to make sure you take that time and i was talking to someone the other day who you know listed all these different reasons she was she was stressed and you know when different people in the group suggested different ways that that maybe would help and you know she just didn't have the time and she had stress coming from her work stress mm. coming from her husband making demands stress coming from her children making demands her family her health all sorts of things mm. and she almost just just didn't have the the time to do anything that would would help her but i i think you know women it seems in particular have it coming from so many different directions that at some point 
they have to insist if they're in that environment that that there is some time that they take out for themselves. Yeah, I, you know, I absolutely agree. And I see a lot of people, a lot of amazing women who do everything to care for those around them. So their husbands and their children and their friends and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, they, they do amazing things, but it's to their detriment, uh, to the detriment of their health. Um, and, and I, and I think it's, it's, it, it takes a, a strong person to actually say, no, I am going to need some time for myself. Um, and it's putting yourself first, um, not all the time, but putting yourself first from time to time. Because I really believe if, if, if the, um, the matriarch, the, the woman of the house is, is not in good shape um, mentally or physically, how can they look after everyone to to the level that you know that that sh- that shows optimal health for the rest of them? So exactly, it's actually in everyone else's benefit for her to take time for herself. Totally, and I and I know. Um, I hope this doesn't ups- upset um, any people who are listening, but I see this with 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 nurses a lot, and I have a lot of I have incredible respect for nurses because the the type of work that nurses do is just it's just absolutely admirable, um, and and um, and not everyone can do that kind of work. They give so much, and and some of the work is is not great. It's not it's not you know it's it's not that pleasant, um, but they are so giving, and um, and I see a lot of nurses that are in really bad shape themselves um, physically, and I I wonder if it's that. Um, nurturing, giving, amazing personality that um, th- th- that they give to the to the people that they look after, and they've got nothing left for themselves, you know. And it's 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 a real it's a real shame, and I I don't know how to change that. Um, but yeah, I, I see that very often. It is a real shame, and like you say, it's it's often the people who give the most. Yeah, who end up in problems sure. themselves, and that that just seems so unfair. Yeah, and look, I'm not saying uh, you know be be a selfish person by any stretch, but it's finding the balance between looking after yourself amidst looking after um, everyone around you. And ultimately, it's not being selfish because, like you said before, taking care of yourself enables you to take care of the the people you need to take care of better. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I th- th- that's that's what I believe absolutely. Yeah. And sleep is incredibly important as well, um, which is which is under acknowledged as um, as a as a contributor to health. Um, and you know when your sleep is compromised and you're tired and you're grumpy and you make poor choices and it just it sort of spirals from there. So you know looking at um, becoming resilient is um, sleep, getting good amounts of sleep is part of that. And if, you know, when you get to the area or the time of your life around menopause and sleep is disrupted, um, then it might actually be um, trying to make time during the day to have, you know, 20-minute power naps just to regenerate. Um, so there are ways and means that you can um, capture little snippets of sleep if um, if you can't manage to get a, a good eight hours uninterrupted um overnight that's why it's so important isn't it to to look at everything because the the tendency is just to focus solely on what you're eating and and to put all the blame on that if things are going wrong and to put all the weight on that to to solve all your problems but often it can be you know it can be all these other things that are impacting just as much if not more absolutely yeah i totally agree gosh there there are so many things that I'd, I'd love to keep <laughs> talking with you about all night and all day <laughs> in in your time zone, but we're going to have to bring it to a close here. And um, how? Yeah, because you need like... your sleep. You need to get your sleep. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and how I like to do that is is to get a top tip from you to our listeners. Right. So my top tip is know your why. So really understand why you are doing what you are doing. And I think if you can really understand and knowing knowing what you're doing and why you're doing it, um, it'll, it, it'll make things play out 
um, in a more straightforward way. And this, this relates to, um, to low carb. It relates to whether you want to do keto, why you're doing keto, uh, why you're doing fasting. Um, understand why you're doing it and the rest will follow. Yes. And, and it, it's good, isn't it, to have that when you know your why, it really helps with the motivation to, to keep going. Absolutely. Totally. Fantastic advice. And gosh, that, that show has been packed full of so much information that it, it's funny as we were going along. I, I have quite a large Facebook group and there were names that kept popping into my mind of particular right. people that I was thinking about when I was asking some of the questions and listening to some of the things you were saying. So I just know that so many people are going to get real real benefit from from this podcast oh that's Thank fabulous you so much karen it's, it's it's been brilliant you're welcome it's been great chatting to you thank you very much to get the resources and links from the show please go to ketowomanpodcast.com are you my next extraordinary woman maybe you've got an idea for a show a topic you want to hear about let me know how I can tickle your earbuds by dropping me a line at daisy at ketowomanpodcast.com. If you fancy joining me on this exciting adventure and want to help me create new episodes, please go to my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash ketowoman or simply hit the support button on the Keto Woman Podcast website. It's thanks to the two keto dudes that I'm hosting this podcast. So please consider heading to their Patreon page at patreon.2keto.com and help them bring you more podcasts like this one. Please help other people hear about and find this podcast by reviewing the show on iTunes and Facebook. Every star and review really does help. It doesn't go unnoticed by me, the people who regularly like, share and comment on my posts. Your support means the world to me. Thank you. This week's end quote is an old Maori proverb. I'm not going to mangle the original, but you can find it in the show notes. Here is the English translation. Turn your face to the sun and the shadows will fall behind you. Bye bye, cutie lovelies.